Um, Annie is a data science expert. She works at Boston Consulting Group uh, in Boston. She joined the firm in 2018 and is active in the healthcare and corporate finance and strategy practices. She's an expert in machine learning, analytics, data exploration, complex project management, and she has developed novel algorithms for solving complex data analytic problems in a wide variety of subject areas, including fraud and anomaly detection, healthcare diagnostics, infrastructure capa capaci capacity, sorry, and utilization in smarter cities and big data and human machine cooperation. Annie holds 23 patents in data analytics. I'm really impressed just reading this. Data architectures and algorithms and their applications. She has also over 40 publications in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. Before joining BCG, um, Annie was a principal research scientist at IBM. And before that, a research scientist at MIT, where she received her MS and a PhD. And Annie, you told me that you're one of the first women having graduated from MIT. You were the, the fifth woman. We do have a brain with us today, <laughs> and, uh, and, and in addition to being a start, Annie, thank you so much for being here. Over to you, okay, you're going to so discuss, mm, yes, and you have the mic over there, just speak in the mic. Thank you. Thank you for this great introduction, it's all overstated. Um, I, I've done what I've done, what I like to do, and I'm very happy about that, and I'm very happy to continue it being able to do it at BCG Gamma, uh, doing more data science. The topic I'm going to talk today about is the intersection of AI and healthcare, especially in rare diseases. Um, unfortunately, there are over 7,000 rare diseases, which we know about. I'm sure there are more. and. Um, in, in the European Union, because we're in Europe, uh, a disease is classified as rare if it has only one, less than one in 2,000 people um, who are affected with it. Um, in the States, it's slightly different. And the thing which is important about being classified as a rare disease in the States, approval for medicines are done differently and faster because, as you know, clinical trials, you have to find enough people who have this rare disease. Um, just to give you even more sort of bad news before we get to the good news, um, there are roughly 350 million people worldwide affected with rare diseases. 80% um, of these diseases have a genetic origin. We, not that we always know how to deal with that. And 50% of the rare diseases afflict children. And 30% of patients die before the age of five. So this is sort of really um, horrible diagnosis. But we'll get to how we can make it better. Um, just to make it even more horrible, if I can, it takes roughly five years for a person to be diagnosed with a rare disease, and a person will see seven different doctors. Uh, so it's a very painful journey, delays diagnosis, uh, which means it delays any kind of treatment. Um, so why is it so difficult to do, to diagnose rare diseases? There are basically two factors to it. One of them is because it's rare, most doctors haven't seen a disease like that. They may have learned about it in medical school a long, long time ago. Uh, the other issue is that a lot of rare diseases uh, present themselves like a common disease, right? You, if you start with having stomach problems, uh, nobody will say, oh, you should get tested for cancer, right? Because that's neither in the interest of the patient nor in the interest of insurance. Um, However, Crohn's disease and intestinal cancer can present themselves, do present themselves with the same kind of symptoms uh, in the beginning, right? You're tired, you're bloated, you don't feel good. There are other diseases of the lungs where you are, you have a cough, again, you're tired. Everybody is always tired, right? Just because you're tired, we should all be in the hospital because I believe we are all tired now. Um, the other thing is there's um, heart diseases. 
which present themselves if you see a particular pattern in an ECG. Again, if your doctor misses that pattern, they will not notice that you may have the disease. Um, and then your outlook in life will be a little bit more difficult. Um, the, so how can, we, um, how can we overcome it? One of them is, so most doctors haven't seen a patient with a rare disease. If in theory we could put all the doctors together in one room worldwide, then there would be a bigger density of doctors who have seen the disease. How can we do that in the real world? Um, in the real world, doctors are all over the place. To make things even more difficult, um, their data is kept in silos. Everybody hangs on to their data very tightly. Data is organized very differently from doctor to doctor, from hospital to hospital, from country to country. Um, so it is actually quite difficult to assemble the data. Um, let's assume, but again, let's assume we have assembled the data. Then, so we all have the zillions of data like all the doctors in the same room. Then we can build a model of what is a patient with a particular disease. Um, it's like if you go to a doctor, the doctor will ask you, do you have X, do you have Y, do you have a cough? Did you take this blood test? Did you have an ECG? And all this stuff. So each disease actually has a model behind it which identifies that you have this disease. So once we have all this data, we can build models of diseases. Not only can we build models of the disease of patients who have a certain disease, but we can also then look at what are the treatments, how do they react. I mean, if you look at, for instance, just a sidetrack, if you look at the evolution of cancer, when cancer was first came into our, all our lives, um, people did radical surgery, right? Because that's all they was the best treatment. Now you do laparoscopic small surgeries and you help people. Again, you build a model of a patient's disease. And because you have all this data, you also build a model of a patient who has sort of similar symptoms, but again, something different, but that they only have Crohn's disease and not cancer. Again, you can do that because you have all this wonderful, wonderful data in uh, together. So now when you have these models, I'm now a doctor and a patient comes to me and I have to diagnose the patient. I can then, and there are mathematical models for this, you can see if the patient is more similar to the patient who has the rare disease or the more common disease. It's, again, I'm not saying that AI will diagnose us, it is, it can help the doctor to get a hint, right? Again, I want to stress this again, because it's a very sort of passionate thing for me, is when we build these models, we have to make sure that the data is not biased. What I mean is, so you train the data on the model to give you a, the most starkest example, breast cancer, is all modeled on women. However, unfortunately, men can get it too, and they're a lot of times overlooked because the model is biased. Uh, the data is biased. The data is biased. That is a general topic in AI. When you build these models, you have to build a model which really reflects the population you want to diagnose or identify, whether it is a disease or whether it is the system who judges how much you should punish a person in where it is used or whatever, any kind of other things. So, so now I said, okay, so we have these wonderful lots of data. We built these models. There are lots of mathematical uh, methods to build these models, and I will not bore you with them because this is just, you just hire the right people and they will build your model once you have the data. Um, I mean, it's easier said than done. Um, 
that. So now, how do we get to all this data? So one of the one of the good and the bad thing about like everything else in life is that the data is de-identified, right? So when you uh, actually even buy data, it doesn't say George Smith has this disease. It will be identified with a number, right? And in the states, when you buy insurance claims, you will know the doctor. In Europe, you don't. So it's even more de-identified. So you have these different databases which create, which have different information in them. But they have very, some things they have similar. For instance, they will know what else you suffer from. And um, if you have, um, do you have a cough? Do you have a heart attack? Do you have whatever else you have? Maybe what medicines you're taking, maybe whether you have high blood pressure or not. There are certain information which are not available. And again, cancer is an easy example. Um, cancer treatment depends on how severe the cancer is, right? When you look in doctor's notes, you will find how severe it is. If you look in insurance claims, you will not find that identification. Okay, so what do we do with that? The nice thing about insurance claims is there's, that's much more data than medical notes. Medical notes are very tiny in general, but the principle how we combine them and link those is the same. We built a model it always comes back to model building of the patient, the patient with a certain severity of, um, of the cancer, and you apply that model on the next data set because you have certain information which is the same, so you get a bigger pool in the next data set. And you can keep on going that to link the different siloed data together. Clearly, it is not 100% precise, uh, but you just, basically what AI will give you, gives you hints, some very good hints. I mean, medicine is not precise. It's an art form. Um, at least that's my personal uh, attitude about it. Um, so we have, so model building will help us link those data together. Once we have lots of data, we have, um, we can build a model which differentiates a very sick patient from one which just should take two aspirins and call me in the morning kind of disease. Um, and then the doctor only has to use that information. Again, the doctor cannot rely on that information um, to get a better diagnosis. But now we still have one more problem left, right? So we built this model so that the uh, doctor can use that to think whether you have disease A or disease B. How do we, and, but these models are built on data of real patients, right? Um, so we have to have privacy. We cannot, we have to make sure that not a single patient who is used, whose data is being used uh, to build the models can be identi back identified. To give you a very simple rule in HIPAA rules in the United States, if you are over the age of 86, your age will not be recorded. It only says you're over 86 because in any particular region, you may not have that many old people. But you have to go a little bit further in making really sure that you cannot reconstruct a particular person. And there's a mathematical framework uh, the differential privacy framework, which started around 2006. Um, uh, Cynthia Dwork created that, and there's lots of more research done, which shows that within a very small chance, you cannot re-identify a patient in your statistical model. And it's used in uh, government statistics, so it is sort of an accepted uh, privacy model. And the way this model works is actually quite simple. It creates a little bit of noise um, in the data. So you add two more patients and 
you, know, you add enough noise that you cannot be re-identified, but you don't add too much noise that the data becomes useless. So it is a fine sort of dance there. Um, so that's how we get to diagnose patients easier. I hope none of us will ever need this AI for any of us or any of our family and friends. But it's nice to know that it's, that it's there and, and helps all of us to overcome the issues of rarity. Thank you, Annie, and um, thank you.